Last time we, uh, by the way, we have new people here, and we always have new folks who listen during the, through the internet uh, or through uh, CD or DVD. We're studying the book of Acts, verse by verse. And the reason for the importance of the book of Acts in your Bible, uh, for those who are here, this is a, just a visual uh, um, chart showing the Bible from Genesis through Revelation and God's program through that time. We have what we have, time past. We have the but now, what God is doing today in our current age. And then the future, the ages to come. This, this uh, chart just shows all mankind from Adam and then other men whom God dealt with. Uh, Noah would be around here, but you have Abraham, um, who from Abraham's seed, God created the nation of Israel. God separated Abraham. Abram made his name Abraham, a father of many nations. He, he separated him from the Gentiles, the nations. And for a time, for thousands of years, God only dealt with one nation in particularly, and he, he dealt with other nations, the Gentiles, as they related to this one nation, the nation of Israel. But when we come to the book of Acts, something happens. After God leaves uh, the, the nation of Israel through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have a book called Acts or Actions or Activities of the Apostles called Acts of the Apostles. And what this book is written by God to show is the fall of the nation of Israel and salvation going to the Gentiles through one new apostle, Paul. It has the activities of the 12 apostles given to the nation of Israel. Those 12 men who would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the kingdom that Christ will set up on the earth. But when, when the nation of Israel stoned Stephen in Acts 7, committing the unpardonable sin, and they laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who was also called Paul, God set Israel aside. And then, as you see their fall, you see their diminishing in the book of Acts. We'll be seeing that as we go forth. And by Acts 28, they're totally cast away. God has a message for all nations, both Jew and Gentile alike, individuals, called the gospel of the grace of God. That's where Paul's ministry. You see the 12's ministry prominent from Acts 1 through about 7, 8, 9, mid-Acts. When Paul shows up, you see the diminishing of those 12 apostles' ministry. After Acts 16, Acts, Acts 15, you don't even see Peter anymore. He was the head apostle to the 12. You see James and some of the others, but their, their ministry is done, as it were, at least as far as setting out Messiah to the world or to the Israel. Now God picks up one man, Paul, and sends him out to us Gentiles. And you and I today live in what the Bible calls the dispensation of grace, where we're, we're getting saved by Paul's gospel. That's how that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. The message that we believe is in 13 epistles of Paul, Romans through Philemon. The reason Paul is in your Bible, and he wrote more books of the Bible than any man, 13, Romans through Philemon, is to show what God is doing in the present. That's why when you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Acts, and you take verses written to Israel, they don't work for you. I know what people say, but if you're honest, you realize when you pray that prayer the way God says it back there, it didn't work for you. Now, it's not because you don't have enough faith. It's not because you have secret sin. It's because all the promises of Christ today are found in Paul's epistles for you and I, and, and he says he will answer them. Paul is the apostle, the sent one of, of the Lord Jesus, Acts 9, of grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, what God accomplished at Calvary. Paul talks about the mystery of Christ. This information wasn't made known back in time past. It has a Gentile ministry and message for the nations, and it has to do with us in heaven. I tell you all the time, nobody before Paul in the Bible looked to die and go to heaven. Search it out. I've talked to pastors for years. Tell me one man before Paul who said, I'll die and go to heaven to be with the Lord. It never happened. A heavenly hope didn't come until Paul. It's then where a, a, a believer trusts Christ, and when they die, they go into heaven to be with the Lord. We're going to go in the rapture. The church, the body of Christ, will be raptured out of here to the heavenly places before God pours out his wrath. This is the future. Hebrews through Revelation in your Bible. Hebrews, look at this. Romans are Gentiles. How would you know that God went from dealing with the Jewish people in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The book of Acts explains how God now is dealing with Gentile Romans, the ones who had Israel under their feet. If without the book of Acts, you wouldn't know how God went from dealing with Israel to these Gentiles so fast. Acts explains that. When you're done with Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, you pick up 
the next thing in God's program, the book of Hebrews through Revelation. These books speak again to the nation of Israel. God went, will finish his program. Let's look at that. Acts chapter number 15, where we left off, verse 21. Acts 15 and verse 21. If you're new to this study, we do put them on the internet because you need to get all the background. We started in Acts 1 verse 1, and now we're in Acts 15. Acts has 28 chapters, so if the Lord tears, we're going to get there. We're going verse by verse. Here, James is prominent. Um, in the little flock, in, in that, in that, amongst those apostles, James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, is now prominent. Remember, James, Peter, and John, that was uh, during the Lord's earthly ministry, there's Peter, James, and John. James and John are brothers. Well, James, the brother of John, dies in Acts 12. That's a sign that Israel is being set aside. James, who is the Lord's brother through Mary, now is prominent in the book of Acts, and he's the one speaking here. James says in verse 21, Acts, Acts 15, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now, why did James bring this, up, bring this up? Because the synagogue was the place of assembly. I showed you that that word synagogue means an assembly, a congregation, and particularly Jews. But there were Gentile seekers, Gentiles who heard about the God of Israel and wanted to know more. And so they would go to these Jews in the synagogues. In prophecy, in order for a Gentile to be right in the eyes of God, he had to go find a Jew and become a Jew, get circumcised and keep the law. But when Paul showed up, God changed that program. He has a grace message. Uncircumcised Gentiles can just trust Christ, his shed blood on the cross, get saved, get blessed with all spiritual blessings without ever being um, circumcised or keeping the law. Well, James says, out there amongst the Gentiles in these synagogues, look at verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city and particularly he's talking about every city where Jews were scattered. According to the law, Moses tells Israel if they're bad, in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and, and, and the prophets mention it too, starting with the Babylonian captivity of uh, J Jeremiah there. Be um, Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys Israel, takes them captive. You see that in the book of Daniel. God scattered the nation, uh, the nation of Israel amongst the nations. A sign that the nation of Israel was out of God's will is the fact that any Jews are outside of the land. Well, that happened with the, first it happened with the Assyrian captivity, the northern ten tribes. Then it happened with both, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, then the Median Persians, then the Grecians, then the Romans. Jews were scattered abroad. But when they went out there, the prophet says, I will give you favor from among these Gentiles. You can have your religion, and even the Roman Empire allowed the Jews to have their religion and their government. As long as they didn't cause trouble, Rome says, have your religion. That was the blessing of God. And so while they're amongst these Gentiles, they set up synagogues. And so the Jews would read Moses and the prophets every Sabbath day, every Saturday there. But Gentiles would come in here too. But now that Paul is on the scene and the grace message, God has a message for these Gentiles that have nothing to do with the law. And that's what James is talking about, verse 21. We saw before in verses 17 through 20 that James says, look what he says, uh, verse 8, verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And we saw last week those are things that destroy your soul and your body. And God took those certain things out of the law of Moses and says, don't do those things because they'll destroy you, all those things. And we saw the wisdom of God with Israel. God, the, the, the way you know that this Bible is written by God, he wrote things to the nation of Israel way back here through Moses 3,500 years ago that the heathen Gentiles didn't do. Something as simple as running water, cleansing yourself in running water, kept disease off. Well, the Gentiles didn't even learn that until our, our time, basically. Well, God put wisdom in there, okay, and, uh, and a lot of other ordinances. So these things were written so that the Gentiles won't pollute themselves, both their spirit and their body. But also, look at verse 21 again. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. 
so that the Gentiles would know that although they're listening to Moses, I can teach you the, the books of Moses, but you need to know they're not written to you or about you. You're not to go back to Exodus and Leviticus and take principles that God wrote to Israel and put it on you as a Gentile living under grace. That's what James is saying. Hey, Moses is being preached out there amongst those Gentiles in those synagogues. We need to get some word to those Gentiles that they're not under the law. They're under grace. Now, this is before Paul wrote all his epistles. Now that you and I have a full revelation from God through Paul, a grace message to Gentiles, we don't, we don't need a synagogue. We just come together as we do today. We learn about the grace message that we live under. We can learn about the law. I go through all the Bible, rightly divided. Let's look at it. Verse 21. Until Paul wrote his grace epistles, God, in order to protect, protect the Gentiles who week after week were hearing the law, he has James and those Jewish leaders write to the Gentiles and say, look here, I know you're listening to the law in, that, in, in those synagogues, and that's good. It's the word. It was the only written word of God until Paul finished his. But understand, Gentiles, as those Jewish writer, uh, readers, uh, te teachers read that law, you're not under that law. That's what we're writing. Look what it says. He says, um, Moses of old time. Uh, hold your hand here. Get a couple of passages in the Old Testament. Keep your place in Acts 15. Go to Psalm 147 and Malachi chapter 4. Go all the way back to the book of Psalm. Psalms. Psalm 147 and Malachi 4. <clears throat> Just because we're Gentiles living under grace, the dispensation of grace, doesn't mean you don't need to know the Old Testament. I could teach the Old Testament as well as any Jewish rabbi, in fact, better, because they don't understand Paul, and they're not saved. They don't trust Christ as their Messiah, they don't have the Holy Spirit, and they don't understand Paul's ministry. We can go back as Pauline grace believers and understand better than Jewish rabbis the Old Testament, because Paul did. He'll teach it to you. In the Old Testament, in Psalm chapter 147, look what the psalmist says about the word of God. Psalm 147, verse 18. 147 of Psalm 18. He sendeth out his word, speaking of the Lord, and melteth them and causes his wind to blow and his waters to, the, waters to flow, the waters flow. So he's talking about how God works in creation. Verse 19. He showeth his word unto who? Jacob. Now who is Jacob? Jacob is the physical born name of, of Israel. Jacob means deceiver, supplanter. That was his born name. That's a type of the, of, of the physical nation of Israel. But when God sees him because of his covenant, he sees him as, as Israel, the princes of God. That, that's what he's going to do with believing Jacob. The, 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 the people of Israel, the people of Jacob's seed, Jacob was the, was, was, became Israel. They, the believing remnant will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus on the earth as kings and priests in the future. He says, he showeth his word unto Jacob. Look, look at the rest of that verse. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. That's the, another name for the, for the people there. Abraham's seed, Israel, princes of God, Elohim, princes of, of God. Keep reading. He hath not, verse 20, dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they, those, those other nations, have not known them. And then the psalmist says, praise ye the Lord. When you're reading the Old Testament, and, and I'm going to tell you, the Old Testament includes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll show you why I say that. Okay? When you're reading God's program with the nation of Israel, and, and by the way, since Psalms, there, there, there's a future book's for Israel, but they have a, a, a prophetic look out in the future. We'll look at that later. When you're reading that, God sent that word to the nation of Israel. He showeth his word, verse 19, unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. When it comes to the other nations in the earth, God didn't write his word to them. It doesn't mean they didn't have it. They, they wouldn't know it, but they'll know it through Israel first. Israel has to give it to them. Israel was created to be the princes of God, the priests of God to give the word to the Gentiles, and they'll do it in the kingdom. Look what he says. As for his judgments, verse 20, they have not known them, speaking of the, the, the heathen nations. And then, I love this, praise ye the Lord. 
The psalmist says, praise the Lord that he gave his word to us and not to them. Why? Because that's the, that's the program. God is not, he didn't have a word for Gentiles. Well, he did. Over there in the book of Am- uh, Joel chapter 3, he says, we'll see that on the way there. Go with me, if you will, to Malik. Uh, go to Joel chapter 3. The book of Joel, one of the minor prophets, chapter 3. Here's God's word to the Gentiles, but it's through Israel. It's just funny because he has a word for Gentiles. Look at verse 9. Joel chapter 3 and verse 9. Watch what the Lord writes. Proclaim ye this among the who? Gentiles. Now, I'm not going to steal Joshua's thunder. He's going to talk about the Gentile ministry in Ephesians 3. That term among the Gentiles is used by Paul a lot, but it's different. When our apostle uses it, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. When God writes it through the prophet Joel in the nation of Israel to, to, to proclaim something, and by the way, that's going to happen in, during the tribulation period. Watch what he says. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare what? War. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. God says, you tell those Gentile heathens, I'm coming back, and I'm going to pour out my wrath. So tell them to prepare war. It, it, it has a look at the battle of Armageddon, which happens right out here at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. But look what he says. He keep, keeps going in verse number 10. I like this. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourself together all around about. There that calls thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Hey, God is telling them, Stop with your, your farming. Take those things and make you weapons of war. Now, it's funny because when the prophets of Israel talk about the Lord's return in the kingdom, he's going to tell them they're going to take their swords and turn them into what? Plowshares. And he says they're going to take their spears and turn them into pruning hooks. There will be no more war in that kingdom. All the instruments of war will either be burnt up or changed to, uh, in that day, the agricultural things to plow the fields in abundance. But God tells those Gentiles, take y'all stuff and make war, make, make, make weapons with them because I'm coming out. See, that's the message of God to Gentiles in time past. That's not God's message to the nation of Israel. He, he, he gives them a message of comfort. Go with me to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi, the last book of what they call the so-called Old Testament, uh, Genesis through Malachi. I'm going to show you why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John includes the, 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 the Old Testament. We'll look at a couple verses. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, and look at verse 4. Speaking of the day when the Lord comes. Remember ye the law of Moses, my what? Servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all who? Israel with the statutes and judgments. So if you want to know why Moses of old time was out there being preached Every Sabbath day in the synagogues, it's because of verses like this. Psalm, he says, preach the word of, of God to, to Israel. Malachi, preach the word of the Lord to Israel. Those Jews were zealous for the law and the prophets. But once God changed the program when he raised up the apostle Paul, Acts 9.15, Jesus Christ our Lord says, I make him my chosen vessel to take my name out to the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Those children of Israel who are amongst the Gentiles. God has an a, a, a all-man ministry now through the Apostle Paul and what Christ gave him about the cross of Christ saving. Uh, go to Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew chapter number 10. As the Lord Jesus Christ sends out his apostles in that first uh, 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 commission. See, people talk about the great commission of Matthew 28, but Christ gave great commissions all through there. He would send out the 10, he sent out the 70, he sent out, he gave commissions. He was a king giving out his commissions to his servants. But watch this one. He had just, he had disciples, and he's going to pick 12 disciples to make them apostles. Apostles mean sent ones. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12, now what's that word? Disciples. Notice their disciples there. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Hey, why was the Lord doing that? Why did he give them 
power against unclean spirits. Unclean spirits are those fallen angels under Satan's dominion who came into the nation of Israel to take God's land. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is casting out those devils. So he's getting them off God's land. It's the time of reclamation. Time to get back what's rightfully his. What he gave to Adam, what Adam allowed his wife to deal with the, the, the serpent, and Adam fell. And from that point on, Satan was the god of this world. And what Christ began to do as the kingdom of heaven is at hand within reach for Israel was casting out devils, getting them off his land. He's casting out the, the squatters. So he gave them the ability to do it. Look what he says there in verse 1. To cast them out and to heal some manner of sicknesses and, and some manner, huh? All, yeah, all. See, when you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't let them get you. When you're using those prayer promises and sickness and disease and all those things, notice with Christ, it was always all. Not some, all. People say some today. But no, no, it was all. I showed you in 1 Corinthians 12 when Paul says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to profit with all. One of those was the gifts of healings, and every member of the church, the body of Christ, and Paul, they got the healing they needed. Every member of Israel who wanted to be healed got healed. And that's part of the gospel of the kingdom. Hold your hand here. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. The Lord's earthly ministry starts with the gospel of, of kingdom healing and deliverance ministry. That's different than his ministry for the church, the body of Christ, when we rightly divide the word. Matthew chapter 4, look at verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee. Teaching in their synagogues. He's teaching Moses and the prophets. Watch this. And preaching the gospel of the who? Interesting to me, he starts out by reading Moses and the prophets. He'll stand up there, read it. Moses and the prophets. And then he'll say, you see what Moses says there? You see what Isaiah says there? I'm the man. I'm him. I'm the one you've been waiting. I'm the Messiah. And guess what? The good news is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what he was doing in the synagogues. And the ones who had soft heart to believe Moses and the prophets saw Messiah and says, you're the one we've been waiting on. We're going to follow you into the kingdom. And Christ says, oh, you really are, huh? I'm going to show you some things. Watch that sick man over there, and he just go, would you like to be healed? And bam, healed him. He healed all, heal, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Verse 24, and his fame went throughout all Syria. He's up here. That's why we got these maps. Here's Jerusalem where the religious leaders of Israel were. That's where the temple was. But they rejected him there. He would go north of, of Jerusalem to the area of Galilee, what we call the, the ten northern tribes, and Syria up there, okay? So he'd be out there because if he, if, if, if he went to Jerusalem too much, they kept trying to kill him, okay? He went at the end when he had to go to the cross. Verse 24, and his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers, diseases, and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic, and those that had the palsy and he healed them. When I look at that, he healed them in spirit, soul, and body. Watch this. He says, those which were possessed with devils. Those devils are spirit beings. God put a, put a spirit in man so that man can communicate with spirits. Most men communicate with the evil spirit called Satan and his angels, the idolatry of our world. We grace believers get the spirit of God in our spirit. We communicate with God. The, the God of creation. So there's the spirit. Watch this. He healed that. Verse 24. And those that were lunatic. A lunatic has to do with your mind. Your mind is where your soul resides. Your, your, your soul. Your mind is where your soul resides. Your soul is where your mind. Your, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So he goes not just into the spirit, but it, it then seeks out into the soul. And, and he, he, he would have crazy lunatics and he'd speak a word and they'd be clothed and in their right minds if your mind is messed up you need to get the word of God in your mind and get the mind of Christ and he'll clear, he'll clear it up sober thinking but not just 
the spirit and the soul, but watch the body, the third part of a man. And those which are lunatic, verse 24, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. What's the palsy? We call it cere cerebral palsy, where you couldn't control your, your limbs. God gave them the power to live. And what he was showing them is these are a taste of the kingdom that I'm going to get you. There won't be any sickness in that kingdom, Isaiah 33 says. I believe Isaiah 33. No, in that kingdom, they will no longer say, I am sick. John says over in Revelation, hey, there's going to be no more tears, no more crying, no more sickness, no more death. Well, there will be death in the kingdom, by the way, for those who break the law. Not the Jews, because they'll be under the power, but the Gentiles, okay? They'll be under the power of the Spirit. My point is, this is the Lord's earthly ministry called the gospel of the kingdom. Keep going. Matthew chapter 10, look, look again in verse 1. And when he had called his, unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and, and all manner of disease. Now, verse 2, he goes through the 12. You know the 12. There's James. Oh, no, verse 2, now the names of the 12, what's the next word? Apostles. Notice they changed from just disciples, followers of the Lord Jesus, those who were disciplined by him through his teaching, to those who accepted the teaching and actually are sent out by their master. Apostle, apostolic means sent one. So he sends out these 12 men. He goes through the names, but watch what he says in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, What's those first two words? Go not into the way of the who? Gentiles. Don't go to those Gentile heathens. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even amongst the Galileans, there was the northern part of there, which was part of the Baal worship of Dan way back there in the Old Testament called the Samaritans. They were related to the Jews by blood, but they, the Jews, didn't they, didn't they didn't care about them. Christ has a ministry to them and the Gentiles, but you must start with the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. He says, go, uh, the Great Commission, going you to all the world, preaching the gospel to every creature. Start, he says, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, so that's the capital, the southern region, Judea, Samaria, the northern region, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, that's going to happen in the kingdom. There's a way to do a progression. You start at home and you keep going out. Look what he says here. Um, chapter 10, go start, you see all of that. Go to Matthew 15. I'm just showing you why James says we need to let these Gentiles know they're not under that law of Moses. Because the law of Moses is prominent over 1,500 years by that time out there amongst the synagogues. And Gentiles are seeking God. And in order to understand God, you need to go to a Jew in that day. Let's keep reading. Matthew 15, the woman who has the daughter who's vexed with the devil. Matthew chapter 15, she was a Gentile woman. Look at verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, that Canaan is that Gentile land, came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Here's a poor woman who has a daughter. It's a woman and, and her little girl. And she's grievously vexed with the devil. This devil is, is throwing her all over the place and she's foaming from the mouth. It's, 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 it was horrible sight to see as the Lord and his apostles walk. That woman's right there talking to him and watch what he does. This is, this is Jesus, the compassionate son of the living God, God in the flesh. But well, watch what he does. Verse 23, and he said, oh, dear woman, I love you so much. I'll give you what you ask. Is that what he said? No, no, no. But he answered her what? Not a word. Imagine this woman's there. There's her daughter getting thrown back and forth. The apostles and the Lord are walking, looking for people to give the kingdom of God to. They see her, and they just say, mm, let's keep going. She's like, Lord, Lord, is that son of David? He says, mm, mm, mm. Now, why would he ignore this woman? Let's keep reading. He says, verse 23, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. When she couldn't get the Lord's attention, she was just saying, anybody, help me, help me, help me. And watch what the Lord says. The compassionate, 
perfect, loving Son of God. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of who? The house of Israel. Do you understand that more than his emotion for that woman, he loved that woman, he cared for her, but he cared more about the word of God written, that Messiah was to sit and the children, like, well, he's going to say it. Verse uh, 25, then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Now, the first time she went to him as a Gentile and says, thou son of David, she used words that only the people of Israel could utter about his messiahship. That's his first coming for Israel. But then the second time this woman who represents the Gentile nations in the, in the, out here in the future, when they call out, we learn now that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul says he's the, he's the Lord of all. And when she takes her position under Israel's authority, not trying to be Israel, trying to get it from being Messiah, but just says, Lord, watch what he does. Verse 26, but he answered and said, now watch the doctrine here. It is not meat or fit or proper to take the children's bread and cast it to the who? The dogs. He looks at the people of Israel. He says, they're the children. The children must first be fed, the children of Israel. You dogs, you Gentiles, what he called it, because they're unclean. Dogs are unclean at them. He said, you're unclean. It is not proper for me to give a blessing to you before I deal with my home first. That's what he's saying. But keep reading. Verse 27. And she say, truth, Lord. She says, amen to that, Lord. I believe that. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. That place of provision, if you have a dog, they're sitting right there while you're eating, waiting for you to give them something or fall. And she says, I'll take the crumbs from Israel's table, if that's all, I, all I need is the crumbs. She got it. Watch what he says. Oh, verse 28, then Jesus answered and said unto her, oh, woman, can I tell you something? That oh has to do with his, his uh, affection for her, his, um, it was emotion. He says, you get it. He's going to say to another Gentile, that guy has more faith than all the people of Israel. I have not seen that faith, no, not in Israel or this Gentile heathen. O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. So out here in the future, God will bless the Gentiles as they take their place under Israel's dominion. And it's all through the scripture. So go back with me, if you will, to uh, uh, Matthew, uh, Acts chapter 15. That's what James is dealing with when you get here. Acts chapter 15. James understands that as Moses is read week after week. By the way, in our day, Moses is being read. When we talk about Moses, the law is a performance-based acceptance system. And in churches today that don't rightly divide the scriptures, they're preaching performance-based acceptance. In order to get the blessing of God, you need to do thus, thus, and thus. In order to get the blessing of God, you better not do this, that, or the other. That's not how Paul gives the grace message to Gentiles. Yes, there's consequences of sin. It's called sowing and reaping, Galatians 6. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. That's sowing and reaping. That's just the law of, of, of creation that God put back there. But in order to be blessed by God today, it happens the moment you trust Christ. The moment we trust Christ, we get all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. Israel had to wait for their blessings and perform to get the blessing. We don't today. That's why you must rightly divide. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 22. Then it pleased, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Uh, with Jews, when you send a letter... You also sent a person, a couple of men by mouth, because under the Jewish law, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established, so that somebody couldn't counterfeit the letter. Not only did they write this letter, so we can have uh, uh, written down as Gentiles, well, they could, we got Paul's epistles. They sent men by mouth, and I want you to see the, who these guys were. Verse 22, he says, uh, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Namely, Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, 
and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Now, this guy, Judas, named Barsabbas, he could very well be a, a faithful guy mentioned way back in Acts chapter 1. So go there with me as we co we're coming down to the end. Go, go to Acts chapter 1. There was another guy named Barsabbas who was prominent among the brethren. And he was one of the candidates to be the 12th apostle. Um, the Lord tells the 12, including Judas back here, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in that kingdom. Judas dies, so they need a replacement. Acts chapter 1, and it wasn't Paul. Paul didn't qualify. He was one born out of due time. Um, verse 20, Acts 1, for it is written, Peter writes, uh, Peter says to the men, in the book of Psalms, let his habitation, this is Judas's, the, the betrayer, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. That, that word bishopric, uh, we call it a bishop. Paul says, uh, my office here is the office of a bishop. It's the teaching, preaching elder. Well, that's, it's from that word bishopric. Uh, it, it means his office, his position of authority in that kingdom. So let his bishop, his, his, his office of a bishop, give it to another man. Psalm 109, verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have company with us, what are the next three words? All the time. The reason why Paul didn't qualify, the first reason is, when he was Saul of Tarsus, that Pharisee, he wasn't with these apostles all the time, and he gives you the, the time period, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, as his earthly ministry, from his baptism. There, keep, keep going. Beginning from the baptism of John. So the moment the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized by John and all that ministry there, you had to be. Look what he says. Verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to, 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 uh, to be an apostle? Uh, I'm sorry, must one be ordained to be a witness of his, of, with us of his resurrection? The job of the apostle was to be a witness of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. All of them were. So you had to start right here on the chart and go all the way through his ministry for three and a half years, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. If you were there with them from here to there, you qualified to be Judas's replacement. Now, of the 12 apostles, now there's 11. Judas is dead. Only two other men qualify. Let's look at it. Verse 23, and they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So there's Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias. And we know he goes on to pick Matthias. And then the Holy Spirit comes down on the day of Pentecost, the fulfillment of the Pentecost from Leviticus 23, on the 12 there. But God didn't forget about this man called Joseph called Barsabbas. I believe, you can do your own study of it because I searched it out. God looks at that man and says, he got a heart for ministry and to serve. He got a servant's heart. I believe that's the same guy over here in Acts chapter 15. Go back there. You know, that's the only other place I see that, that issue. So it could be that same guy. You, know, you can believe what you want. He says in verse 22, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, uh, Judas... It's like you, they got different names. Uh, Judas means Judah. Uh, that could have been the same guy, surnamed by Sabbath. It, it could be. I, I, I wouldn't hold it. As I look, those are the only two times I see that, that issue of Barsabbas there. But Silas, by the way, in verse 22, is Silvanus. Uh, Paul talks about him. This guy is prominent in the book of Acts. Over in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, which I'm teaching, is Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus we found out that that guy Silas is also Silvanus, just like Timotheus is Timothy. And you do that. My name's Ronald. People call me Ron, Ronnie, other names, nicknames and stuff. Well, they did it too. You just had different names they went by. Saul was also called Paul. He had his Hebrew name Saul. He was called Paul, or his Roman name. So that happened. So I think that's who that guy is. Now, as we conclude, I want you to see that the purpose of the law, somebody might say, well, Ron, why did... If God was going to eventually get rid of the law as far as a performance-based acceptance, why did he give it in the first place? Well, we're going to look at that. I showed you how, why I, I said, I told you earlier, I believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still under the Old Testament, even though 
the people who put your Bible together, they throw that little paper between Malachi and Matthew. It says New Testament. And I know why they do that, because this is when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up on the scene. But here's why I believe it's still the Old Testament. I want you to get three passages. Well, get two passages, Galatians 3 and Hebrews 9. Get Galatians 3 and Hebrews 9, and we'll end. Start at Galatians 4, then we'll look at Galatians 3. Verse 1. Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. What is he saying? Paul, Paul is dealing with the difference between law and grace. Let's say you have a son. He's a teenager. You're his father. He's your son. You're going to have you got a business. You're going to say, son, I'm going to give you this business. Until he's a man and you decide as, as the father when he's a man. It's not the world. 18, he's legally, but you decide when he, that boy's a man. You're looking at him, you watch him, you say, well, no, he's not ready for my, handle my business now. But when you decide he's on that level where he can take over, uh, then you do what the Bible calls an adoption. It's called bar mitzvah in the Jewish thing. Um, he's your son. He's heir to your empire or whatever. But as long as he's a child, he's just like a servant. And how is he like a servant? Look at verse 2. He's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. See, a servant, a tutor means you teach him stuff. A governor means you tell him what to do and what not to do. You govern his life. You do that with your young son. He's your heir. But you tell him what to do and you teach him what to do. You treat him just like you would your servant in that, in that economy in, Jew, in the Jewish day. But he won't remain a servant like that for long. He's going to grow up. And when that father looks at his son and says, son, now you're a man. I remember I tell you all about Burt Reynolds, the actor. He's a manly actor. He's in all these movies. He's a football player. Guy asks, says, Bert, you've been a good actor out here in Hollywood and all that. When did you know for sure you became a man? When did you Because you're a man's man. He says, well, my daddy told me I was a man. Oh, yeah. And that's how it is. So, verse, uh, verse 3, even so we. And Paul is dealing with those, particularly those Jews in the body of Christ who always want to go under the law. Who always want to deal with the law, performance. But he goes, but even so we, when we were children... The children of Israel, okay, watch this, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So this bondage has to do with the things that hold you and bound you, particularly the law and the way the world ran. Okay, watch this. You didn't have any freedom, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time, remember Christ says the time is fulfilled. Repent and believe the gospel to Israel. But when the fullness of the time was come, that time schedule is found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 at 70 weeks. So when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. He didn't have a father. The father gives you your, your sin nature. He came through Mary. He got a, he got a body, but he didn't, get a, he didn't get the human sin nature. Holy Ghost conceived him. Made of a woman, but watch this. Made where? Under the law. So the Old Testament really is that Old Testament, the law that Israel failed under. We know the Lord came to fulfill that law perfectly and to die for the sins of Israel under that law. He wasn't supposed to die on that cross in unbelief. He was supposed to die in the temple, but the high priest shedding his precious blood and then waiting for him to rise again the third day. But they did it in unbelief, even the death of the cross. My point is, that's still the Old Testament. When Jesus Christ was alive before his death, that's the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, we'll end. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. We'll end in this passage. Verse 15. And for this cause, he, that's Jesus Christ to Israel. Hebrews is written to the nation of Israel. He is the mediator of the new what? Testament. How? That by means of death, it's the cross, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. There's the Old Testament, the law. Okay? He's going to die for the, their sins under that law. 
they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Notice that the promise has to do with an eternal inheritance. Uh, when Paul shows up, our eternal inheritance is, to, uh, is in the heavenly places, but Israel's is on the earth. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the what? Death of the testator. Notice that while Jesus Christ is alive, at least before he dies, all that ground is Old Testament. The Bible says you can't have a New Testament until the death of the testator. He spent three and a half years ministering to the nation of Israel under the law, under that Old Testament. So at the very least, you can't even say it kicked in here. And, and by the way, in my Bible study, what you're going to see is Hebrews looks forward to the kingdom. It's not going to be really fulfilled until Jesus Christ comes and set up his earthly kingdom because the Testament says you have to have the eternal inheritance. They don't have it yet. Let's end in this passage. Verse 17, for a testament is of force. That means it has power. That next word, after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. My point is, when you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, that's why it's not written to you and I Gentiles. It's still under Israel's Old Testament. He hadn't shed his blood. He hadn't died. He spent three and a half years preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Paul's gospel is the gospel of the grace of God. How did Christ die for our sins? Christ's death in Israel was a wicked hands. It was a bad thing, Peter says. But when Paul preaches the cross, and this is where we end, according to the God's grace, we Gentiles can rejoice in the preaching of the cross, for it is this message that saves today. Can I tell you, if you're listening to the sound of my voice and, you don't, and no one ever loved you enough to ask you that if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? God gave his own son's blood there, his own blood on the cross, Acts 20, 28. It was God's blood for your sins so you won't go to hell. If no one ever loved you enough to ask you, do you know for sure that if you die this moment, heart attack or get hit by a car, and you wake up and you're not in the flames of hell, but you're in the, in the, in the holy of holies with the Father, you have to make that decision right now and the decision has to be, do you believe that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again? Now, Israel had works to do. You don't. If you believe, which means trust in your heart, that the Lord Jesus Christ did your, all your saving, you do all the believing. He is the Savior. You're the sinner who he's saving. If you believe his shed blood paid for all your sins, both past, present, and future, God will give you all sins forgiven, even the one you're committing tomorrow or later today. He'll give you eternal life as a present possession. Eternity lasts for how long? Forever. And the gifts of God are without repentance. He won't ever take it back. And he'll give you there at the rapture an eternal inheritance in the heavenly places all by his grace. God will look into your heart, see your faith, trusting his son. In that moment, he'll save you. No water baptism, no church attendance, no tithing, no this, no that. If you are saved today and you're listening, you need to get off that religious treadmill of confusion, mixing law and grace, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with Paul, and learn what God has for you in Christ, because here's where your blessings are. Here's where God says amen to his prayer promises, and he gives you what you ask for according to his will. You don't need to spend any other time not rightly dividing the word. All right? Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your blessed word. Both the word made flesh, your precious son, our, our, our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. His shed blood on Calvary's cross is all our plea, Father. Father, let none of us trust anything but that for our salvation. But Father, after we're saved, you leave us here to do your will, do your business. And let us trust the cross of Christ and not our own works or lack thereof, our own failures or successes, but who you've made us in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. May the grace of God, which is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we study the word of God's grace and the word rightly divided, to understand that this is not religion, this is the power of the grace message, Father.
This is a relationship with the living Savior, the Lord Jesus, your son.